it's time to sit back and relax with your favorite drink. And listen. My little sister was the most harmless kid on the block. Then she started playing Call of Duty. Ah, the thrill of competition. It does different things to different people. For some it excites them and sweetens the very air in their lungs. For others it scares them and causes them to shrink from challenges like small rodents being swept toward a towering inferno. Most human beings fall somewhere in between these two extremes and their lives are all the better for it. However, there is a small portion of people like my sister who don't, and therefore should be regarded as some of the most dangerous people on the planet. I remember how my little sister, Courtney, looked before I introduced her to Call of Duty. She wore her hair in a ponytail, placed animal stickers on her shirt, and smeared too much lip gloss, which she routinely snuck from Mum's makeup drawer, on her lips. In other words, she was a quintessential ten-year-old girl. Giggly, free-spirited, and energetic to the point that she skipped everywhere she went. The word innocence trailed behind her every step, just like her chronically untied shoelaces. Everybody who knew her gushed over her every breath, and her smile was so sweet that it made even the most cold-hearted of teachers blush. But then I introduced her to Call of Duty, and that sweet little girl soon became swallowed up by the behemoth, so frightening that just the thought of what she's done fills my eyes with tears. I can remember that fateful day as if it were yesterday, for it started a chain of events that's not only ruined my life, but the lives of countless others. Her transformation began last month after I called her into my room and placed a controller in her hand. I just returned home from college for the summer, and given how much she'd missed me, I wanted to do something fun with her. Uh, since you've been bored this week, I said, why don't we play a game together? She looked down at the controller, which dwarfed her tiny palms, as if it were an alien object. But I've never played before, she said. You know, video games are boring. Don't Brittany and Tristan play Xbox? Those were two of her best friends. They do, but not when I'm around. They know I'd rather go outside which they say is only fun if I'm there because I know all the good games. I see. Look, don't complain that I'm not spending enough time with you then. The rain's supposed to continue for another week, and the park will still be muddy for at least two days after it stops. Look, play an Xbox all we have. I knew this was a lie, but the thought of spending my summer watching Animal Planet with her on Netflix, the other alternative, filled my stomach with dread. And besides, I wanted to try something new. She'd enjoyed playing sports ever since she was a little girl and had a competitive edge. I thought she might get a kick out of playing Call of Duty with me. If I would have known then just what kind of monster gaming would make her, I would have gladly spent the entire summer watching Animal Planet and would have dissected and applauded every episode as if it were a new Christopher Nolan movie. Fine, she said, placing her fingers on the triggers. I'll give it a shot. I booted up Call of Duty and launched a private lobby. I then loaded us into the game, took a few minutes to teach her the controls, and we started playing. I let her win the first match. She screamed victoriously the moment she reached the kill limit. I could practically see the dopamine firing off in her brain like bullets from the assault rifles roaring on the television screen. I would have put my arm around her shoulders if she didn't hate being touched so much. Little did I know that by giving her this first taste of success, I sent the competitive urges she already possessed spiralling into the stratosphere, opening the doors for the chaos that was to follow. I let her win the second match, which only intensified her pleasure. The moment the game ended, she whooped, hollered, and beat her hands on the floor as if she'd just won the lottery. Although I thought her behaviour at the time was extreme, I figured she was just enjoying the game. Video games excited me too at her age, I still do, so I never imagined that her overexcitement could lead to anything other than, well, a new hobby. It was when I beat her during our third game, though, that I grew cautious of her wild emotions. Immediately after the word defeat flashed across her screen in bold red letters, she slammed her controller on the ground and glared at me with so much hatred 
I felt like I was staring into the eyes of the little girl from The Exorcist. That's not fair, she screamed. You cheated. I looked at her with widened eyes, stunned by this sudden burst of anger. I didn't cheat, I said. I just played better than you that match. Well, nobody can win every game, Courtney. Even the best players in the world occasionally lose. Play me again. Fine. This time I played my best and beat her so badly that angry tears filled her eyes the moment the defeat graphic reappeared on her half of the screen. Before I'd had time to calm her down, she reared back her arm and threw her controller with as much strength as she could muster into the TV. Well, the force of the blow shattered the glass into dozens of pieces and sent the base careening off of my shelf and onto the floor. Silence then consumed the room, broken only by her violent breathing. I was so stunned by the sight of the wreckage in front of me that I didn't speak for over a minute. When I did finally manage to get my vocal cords working, my voice was filled with so much anger that I trembled as I spoke. I can't believe you just did that, I said. Do you know how much that TV cost me? <laughs> You're a cheater, she said, rising to her feet. I'm not a cheater. I'm just better than you. I've been playing Call of Duty longer than you've been alive. You just wait. I'm going to practice, and the next time we play, I'm going to beat you so bad you're going to quit the game forever. Before I had a chance to respond, she flew from my room, heard herself out the front door, and disappeared into her friend Brittany's house. I called my dad and told him about the incident. He said that he'd punish her when he got home and, and to try my best to calm down. So I hung up the phone, took a deep breath, and tried to move past the event. Luckily, I had a spare TV, so I cleaned up the mess, hooked it up, and continued playing. My dad called me an hour later. I need you to go get your sister from Brittany's house. He said. His voice was higher pitched than normal, as if he were stressed. Why? What's going on? I said. Why can't she just walk home like she always does? Because she's just broke Brittany's arm and locked herself in her room. Brittany's mom has been trying to get her to come out for 30 minutes, but Brittany either curses at her or ignores her. Apparently they were playing Call of Duty and things got heated. Courtney's still in there playing as we speak. I need you to coax her out. I'm stuck in traffic and won't be able to get home for another hour. My body filled with numbness at the thought of Courtney breaking anybody's arm, much less her best friend's. She was so young and so docile. Oh, I'll do my best, I said. I'm heading over there now. Thank you, he said. I'll be there as soon as I can. Brittany's mom opened the door moments after I rang the doorbell. Oh, thank God you're here, Brian, she said, wrapping her arms around my neck. I'd feared she'd berate me upon my arrival, given the horrifying injury my sister had just inflicted on her daughter, and was relieved to see shock reflecting on her face rather than rage. Courtney's still in Brittany's room, she said. Follow me. I followed her up the stairs. We paused in front of a white door plastered with Hello Kitty stickers. It's Brian, Courtney, I said. Please open up. It's time to go home. Go to hell, she said, voice ringing loud and clear from under the doorway, despite the grenades exploding through the TV. I flashed Brittany's mum a surprised look. The shock in her eyes matched my own. She's been saying worse things to me, she said. Well, she called me a bitch a few moments before you got here. Oh, that's so unlike her. I looked back at the door and imagined Courtney sitting on Brittany's bed, face glued to the TV screen. I stood there for several minutes, unsure of what to do. But then an idea formed in my mind. Hey, Courtney, I said, trying my best to keep my voice calm. Sounds like you're getting pretty good in there. How about we do a rematch? You might beat me this time. She was silent for so long, I feel the battlefield dancing in front of her eyes had swallowed up my words. But then her voice rang out from under the door. Only if you promise not to let me win. I promise. A few moments later, I heard her feet crossing the floor. I stepped back as she opened the door, then smiled when I saw her face. 
as if that day had been the most normal day of our lives. Come in, she said. The moment I passed into Brittany's room, she slammed and locked the door behind us. My first reaction was to pick her up and carry her out of the house. Given the distance I'd have to carry her, though, I decided to only use physical force if I had no other choice. So I followed her over to the bed and sat down next to her. She already had the private lobby pulled up, and within moments, we'd spawned into the game. Remember, she said, you promised not to let me win. I'll know if you're not trying. Okay, I said. Well, my plan was simple. I get one kill away from victory and then fumble the match at the last second. Allowing her to get a kill or two to win the match shouldn't come across as suspicious and would hopefully calm her down enough for me to persuade her to come home. I could tell my plan was working as we traded kills. So captivated was she by our match that she forgot I was sitting next to her. Well, the moment of truth arrived when the score reached 49-48 in my favour. She'd set the kill limit to 50, so my plan was to throw the last two fights and hand her the victory. Much to my horror, I forgot that my gun class caused my character to drop a live grenade upon death, so after allowing her to stab me, one of these grades exploded under her feet and sent her character hurtling off a bridge, handing me the victory. The moment the word defeat flashed across her screen, a shriek so guttural ripped through her throat that my body broke out in chills. Realizing I was losing control of the situation, I threw her over my shoulder and carried her thrashing back to our house, a feat which took me over twenty minutes. When my dad arrived home a few minutes later, he barged into Courtney's room and screamed at her so violently I thought he was going to give himself an aneurysm. Eventually my mum returned home from work and calmed him down. I fell asleep that night to Courtney's whispered sobs. I woke to find all my toiletries covered in peanut butter. Now, given how allergic I am to peanuts, if I wouldn't have looked down and noticed this substance before brushing my teeth or rubbing on deodorant, I would have ended up in the hospital. Courtney snuck into my room in the middle of the night and tried to poison me. Whether this was a threat or a genuine attempt at ending my life, I don't know. All I know is that it was just the beginning. I covered my nose with my hands to avoid the stench of the peanut butter. Even inhaling a small particle was enough to swell my throat shut and set me thrashing, eyes bulging to the ground. I then backed out of the bathroom as fast as my trembling feet would carry me and ran into my parents' room. It was only eight in the morning and Saturday, so they were still asleep in their bed. The moment they heard my thundering feet on the carpet, their heads shot up like loaded springs. Brian, said my mum, what's wrong? There's, um peanut butter all over my bathroom, I said. Courtney tried to poison me while I was sleeping. They became very still. I watched the color drain from their faces as they turned and looked at each other. Show us, said my dad. I led them through the hall and into my bathroom. Their eyes bulged the moment they saw the peanut butter caked onto every object in sight. Dear Lord, said my dad, voice shaky. Oh, I'm just glad I noticed in time, I said. It's unbelievable that she tried to poison me like this. She hasn't snuck into my room since she was five, and that was because of a nightmare. What are we going to do? said my mum. She turned her head and looked at my dad, whose eyes were so wide they looked like they were made of glass. Well, we're going to talk to her, of course, he said voice resuming its usual gruffness. Then we're going to contact a counsellor and get locks for our doors. We followed my dad to Courtney's room. Courtney, he said, pounding his fist on the door. Open up. We need to talk. Kiss my ass, she said. What did you just say to me? I told you to kiss my ass. Are you going deaf now as well as bald? My father froze as if a gallon of cold water had just been poured down his neck. Never before had Courtney said anything so vulgar to him. She was a daddy's girl and 
normally cried when he even hinted at being angry at her. If she would hurl such a biting insult at him, he was very conscious about his receding hairline, boggled our minds and left us standing dumbly in front of her door like frightened deer. The sound of gunfire drifted under her door. What on earth is that sound? said my mom. Sounds like she's playing Call of Duty, I said. How is that possible? She doesn't have a game system in there. I'll be right back. I ran to my room. The moment I noticed my missing TV and Xbox, I placed my hands on my head. Not only had Courtney tried to poison me during the night, but she'd also stolen my gaming setup. The thought of her sitting in the darkness for over six hours playing Call of Duty with an insidious grin dominating her face filled me with dread. I ran back into the hallway and told my parents the news. Oh, this is getting serious, said my mom. Deep stress lines rippled across her brow. Her hair, which was normally beautiful and well kept, drifted below her shoulders in uncombed ringlets. What should we do now? I asked. We're going to break in and rip that goddamn controller from our hands, he said. I'll teach her to talk to me that way. I watched as he placed his hand on the doorknob and twisted it until his face turned red. However, when the door still didn't budge, he banged his fists on the frame and yelled with so much force my heart skipped a beat. Courtney, he said, turn off the game and open the door right now. I'm not playing around. His voice was drowned out by an exploding grenade. How about you talk to that slut of a wife of yours instead, she said. You know she likes it when you get angry. It excites her. That is not our little girl in there, said my mom, voice just above a whisper. Courtney would never say anything like that. Well, she just did, said my dad. He wheeled around and grabbed my shoulders. How did this all start? You were with her yesterday. Tell me what happened. Well, she was bored, I said. So I asked her to play Call of Duty with me. I let her win the first two matches, but then she started losing and she became so angry she smashed my TV and stormed over to Brittany's house. It was like she'd become a different person. I've never seen her get so angry. My dad let go of my shoulders as Courtney released a torrent of extremities so vile my stomach turned. This isn't happening, said my mom, placing her hands over her ears. That's not my little girl in there. Right, that does it, said my dad. I'm putting an end to this right now. He rammed his shoulder so hard into the door that the nearby pictures nailed to the wall tumbled to the floor. No matter how hard he pushed, though, the door remained shut. She must have blocked the door with her furniture, he said. He placed his hands on his knees to catch his breath. Oh, I knew buying those old cabinets was a mistake. Those things weigh half a ton. How did she move them then? I said. And for the first time that morning, my dad was at a loss for words. I have an idea, he finally said. It's going to cost us a little money, but I think it's necessary at this point. He turned toward me. Brian... Grab the baseball bat from the garage. Okay, I said. I sprinted down the stairs, two at a time, as if I were dodging the bullets exploding from the assault rifles firing in Courtney's room. I returned a few moments later with the baseball bat and handed it to my dad. All right, everybody, he said, grasping the bat with both hands. Stand back. My mum and I backed up to the stairs. A few moments later, the bat struck the door, filling the house with the sound of ringing aluminum. The first blow was a success, and created a hole just large enough in the middle of the door for my dad to stick his face into. Courtney, he said, sticking his face into the hole, I need you to turn the game off and... His words were cut off by a guttural scream. So powerful and pain-filled was this scream that I retreated deeper into the hallway. I watched in horror as my dad pulled his face away from the door, revealing a pink dart jammed into his eye. Courtney must have been waiting for him on the other side and stabbed him the moment he revealed his face. 
That's what you get for putting a hole in my door, asshole, said Courtney, voice just loud enough to drown out my dad's twisted screams. Nobody's going to stop me from playing Call of Duty, not even God himself. My dad's ear-bursting shrieks mixed with the guns firing from Courtney's room. She stabbed me, he wailed. He tried to say something else, but agony distorted his voice beyond comprehension. Oh, honey, said my mum. She dropped to her knees beside my dad, who was sprawled on the floor like a man flayed and crucified. I'm going to get you. Before she could finish her sentence, a torrent of blood spilled onto her jeans causing her to pass out on the floor next to my dad. I stood there by the stairs looking at them, stunned for what felt like hours. Never in a thousand years would I have imagined the situation taking such a gruesome turn. Courtney had only been playing Call of Duty for little over a day. Was it possible that her personality could change so drastically in such a short amount of time? It was as if a malicious spirit, a demon, had possessed her the moment I put a controller in her hands. I heard the sound of raspy breathing drifting from the hole in her door and tore my eyes from my mum's lifeless body. When I saw Courtney's corpse-like face grinning at me through the splintered wood, I nearly collapsed to the floor beside her. Her skin was so pale it looked like she hadn't received sunlight in months. Her brown hair had also turned black from grease and sweat and hung over her shoulders in moss-like clumps. What truly frightened me, though, was her eyes. They were glowing red from ruptured blood vessels and reflected so much hatred I thought I was looking into the gaze of a blood-lusting wolf. These eyes, which peeled away at my flesh like over-sharpened knives, couldn't belong to Courtney. They were too evil and too ancient to belong to a ten-year-old girl. It was then that she said something so terrifying it's haunted me every day since. Just wait until I get my hands on a gun, Brian, she said, voice unnaturally deep. Then I'll show you what I've really learned. She laughed and retreated deeper into the room. A few moments later I heard the roar of firing sniper rifles and exploding grenades as she resumed playing my Xbox. Brian, yelled my dad through his tear-stained screams. Call the police. We need to get her out of there. The word police sprung me into action. I pulled my phone from my pocket and dialed 911. A few moments later, a man's voice greeted my ears through the speaker. 911, please state your emergency. My, my sister just stabbed my father in the eye, I said, voice rushed. He's losing blood fast. What is your address? I stated my address as quickly as I could. Help's on the way, he said. Where's your sister now? She's barricaded herself in her room. Is she injured? No. Does she have any weapons on her? More darts, for example, or possibly a knife or a gun? I paused for a moment to think. We did have a gun in the house, but Courtney had just admitted to not having it. Was she lying? And had she stolen the pistol from my parents' closet during the night? Oh, the thought sent chills rippling down my spine. Well, she definitely has more darts, I said, voice breathless. She might have a gun too. Let me check my parents' closet to see if it's still there. Only do so if you're safe, said the dispatcher. I ran into my parents' room and bolted through the closet door. I then reached for my dad's pistol case, which he'd kept locked under an old pile of shirts, and shuddered when I found it empty. I raised my hand back to my ear with trembling hands. Yes, I said. She has a gun. Okay, said the dispatcher. Take cover. The police will be there any moment. Two patrol cars are pulling onto your street as we speak. As if on cue, I heard sirens wailing in the distance. Less than a minute later, red and blue lights erupted through the windows beside the front door. The police are here now, I said to the dispatcher. Thank you for sending them so quickly. Please stay safe. I hung up the phone and greeted the first officer that passed through the door. Why are you out in the open? said the officer, gun raised. You need to get to safety. Let us handle your sister. Yes, sir, I said, 
I stepped aside as six more cops entered the house. She's in her room. We'll take care of it. Now, get out of here. I gave him a final nod, then bolted from the house. My father's panicked shrieks followed me out the door, like wails from a tornado siren. I watched a handful of paramedics load my parents into an ambulance, then waited in agony for over an hour for the officers to extract Courtney from her room. Even after they cut the power, she refused to move aside the oak cabinets blocking her door. As a result, two officers broke through the mountain of wood with battering rams. Courtney fired a single shot as they apprehended her. Luckily, it missed the officers storming into her room and struck the wall in the hallway. The officers carried her kicking and gnashing through the front door. Every tendon in her body was fully stretched, and her face was filled with so much rage she looked inhuman. I watched in horror as they stuffed her in an ambulance and sped off, sirens blaring down the street. A police officer approached me a few moments later. Would you like a ride to the hospital? He said. I'm sure your sister and parents want you by their side. Of course, I said. Thank you. If I'd known then the horrors that I was going to witness at the hospital, I never would have stepped into the officer's car. Instead, I would have bolted from my lawn as fast as my legs would carry me and continued running until I either collapsed from exhaustion or God struck me dead where I stood. Part 2 An orderly greeted me the moment I arrived in the emergency room lobby. Are you Brian? She said, voice hurried. Yes, I said. How are my parents and sister doing? Your dad's undergoing surgery and your mom's in the lab getting her head x-rayed. The doctor suspects she has a concussion. Both of them are expected to recover soon. Your, um, sister on the other hand. Her voice trailed off, lost in the sea of shock and confusion that had become her face. She's, she's struggling right now. I could tell by the way her voice trembled as she did this that the word struggle was an understatement. What she truly meant was that Courtney was going batshit crazy somewhere deep inside the hospital, and not a damn person on duty knew what to do with her. The memory of Courtney's corpse-like face grinning at me through her splintered door returned to my mind, causing me to shudder. Just wait until I get my hands on a gun, Brian. Then I'll show you what I've really learned. Oh, I could only imagine what kind of chaos Courtney was inflicting in her hospital room. Given the dangerous amount of medical equipment at her disposal, I prayed that the doctors and nurses were monitoring her every movement. If you'll follow me, said the orderly, I'll take you to her. She's been asking for you ever since she arrived. I followed the orderly out of the lobby. We passed into a white-tiled hallway that reeked of bleach rounded a few corners, and then paused in front of a wooden door, so large that two gurneys could easily have passed through it simultaneously. Standing beside this door were two men and one woman. One of the men was wearing scrubs, so I took him to be a doctor. The other man and the woman were wearing dark pants and white waist-length jackets. I figured they were either psychiatrists or counsellors, maybe one of each. "'Hello, Brian,' said the woman." I'm Dr. Brown, the resident psychiatrist. I've been trying to get your sister to talk to me for some time now, but she's refusing to talk to anybody but you. Yeah, she, um, isn't herself right now, I said. I think she's sick. We've checked her vitals and everything looks good, said the man wearing the scrubs. Our technicians are analyzing her blood, but we doubt that anything abnormal will show up. Other than a few ruptured blood vessels in her eyes, she's perfectly healthy suffocated under the weight of the doctor's gaze. I never imagined that I'd be having such an alarming conversation about Courtney. That an activity as common as playing a video game could turn her into such a monster and boggle my mind. I know this is hard for you, said Dr. Brown, but we need you to get her to talk. Once she talks to you, our hope is that she'll open up to me and Dr. Armani. How's she been behaving since she arrived? I asked. Have you sedated her? Is she still acting violent? Uh, we've tried sedating her, yes, said Dr. Armani. But everything we give her has no effect. He paused for a few moments and cast his eyes toward his shoes. I've um, never seen anything like it. 
Dr. Brown flashed him an angry look. What we're trying to say is that we need your help. Are you comfortable going in there and talking to her? I promise you'll be safe. She's heavily restrained. Well, I'll give it a shot, I said. My voice sounded weak, even to my own ears. Thank you. One of our orderlies, Bill, will be in there with you. He's been keeping an eye on her since she arrived. I nodded and then passed through the door. What I saw made my heart spin inside my chest. Shattered, bloody glass covered nearly every inch of the floor. The cabinet doors on the walls were either dented or hanging on by a single hinge. In the right corner of the room languished the tattered remains of an EKG machine. When I saw Courtney's corpse-like face grinning at me through the shadows, I resisted the urge to hightail it back into the hallway. Even though she'd been at the hospital for under an hour, her condition had exponentially worsened. Dark circles the colour of plums lined her eyes and stretched halfway down her cheeks. Blood filled her corneas from dozens of ruptured blood vessels. And if her eyes didn't make her face look horrid enough, snot caked her nose like dry concrete. However, her hair is what shocked me most. Where it had once been thick and smooth, it was now thinning and wiry. How it was possible that she was losing her hair, I didn't know. All I knew was that the sadistic spectre grinning at me through the darkness was still my little sister, and I needed to do everything in my power to help her. Oh, I'm glad you made it, Brian, she said. Her voice was raspy and deep, as if she'd been smoking for twenty years. The sound made my hair stand on edge. Yeah, me too, I said, trying to keep my voice steady. I've been worried about you. I'm here to help you recover. How delightful. Would you like some food? You look famished. I can have Bill fetch you some peanut butter crackers. I turned round and glanced at Bill. He was sitting on a stool beside the door and looked to be about forty-five. We made eye contact for a few seconds before he lowered his eyes to the floor. His slumped posture reminded me of an abused dog afraid of receiving another kick from his master. I forced my gaze back onto Courtney. How can you say that to me? You know that'd kill me. The way Courtney's grin widened as I said this was all the response I needed. If you want to kill me, then why didn't you do it last night? You had every opportunity to. Because you owe me another match. I'd never let a little bitch like you die before I had my way with them. Your days of playing Xbox are over, Courtney. You're too competitive. Oh, on the contrary, my career is just getting started, and neither you nor those shit-faced doctors carrying behind the door can do anything to stop me. Those doctors want to help you. You're not yourself. Playing Call of Duty did something horrible to your mind, but, but you're going to get help now, I promise. I don't need any help. I've never felt better in all my life. Do you honestly think I'm going to let those assholes put me in a madhouse? Hell no. You don't have a choice, Courtney. Not after everything you've done. I don't need a choice. Not when I have a plan. And now that you're here, I can finally put my plan into action. If you won't play me in the game, then you can play against me here. And Courtney burst through the straps restraining her to the bed and sprinted through the door. She bought multiple syringes from her hospital gown as she ran. The stunned stares of Dr. Brown and Dr. Armani greeted me as I hurried into the hall. Did she just break through her restraints? said Dr. Armani. Yes, said Dr. Brown. We need to find her before she hurts someone. Dr. Armani, call the police. She looked at me. Brian, please wait in the lobby. I know she's a sister, but I don't want you getting hurt. Hell no, I said. You need me. I'm the only person who can either calm her down or give her what she wants, whatever that may be. We rounded a corner and came upon a nurse writhing on the ground with two syringes jammed into her throat. Oh my God, said Dr. Brown, leaning down next to the woman. The nurse was covered in blood and shivering. I watched as Dr. Brown cradled her head in her lap and yelled frantically for a gurney. I stood there for a few more moments, staring back at the nurse in shock. 
but after realising that every moment I wasted put more distance between myself and Courtney, I continued jogging down the hall. All around me, nurses and orderlies scrambled to lock down the patients' rooms. The entire ER resembled an anthill turned on its head, and Courtney was its diabolical queen. I rounded another corner and came upon her next victim, an elderly man wearing a hospital gown. He also had a pair of syringes protruding from his throat and was gargling on his own blood. Two nurses grabbed him by the arms and pulled him inside a room as I flew by. How was Courtney managing to run so far without being apprehended? It was as if every person who dared stand in a way met the same gruesome fate of her syringes, or fell victim to her speed. Where the hell could she be? It was then that I had a realisation so frightening it caused my heart to gallop. She was fleeing to my parents' rooms. Luckily, the orderly who greeted me in the lobby had handed me a paper containing my parents' room numbers before departing, so I knew their locations. When I arrived at my father's room, a gruesome sight greeted my eyes. The bodies of two nurses lay lifelessly in front of the door, mangled and bloodied. I stepped around them and peered through the door. When I saw my father's corpse hanging awkwardly off his hospital bed, severed throat brushing against the floor, my stomach leapt. A few moments later, a doctor thundered up behind me. He placed his hands on his knees the moment he saw the carnage. Dear God, he said. He threw himself to the floor and performed CPR on one of the nurses. I bolted down the hall in the direction of my mom's room, praying that I reached her in time. However, by the time I reached her room, Courtney had already been there, and my eyes were greeted by a similarly gruesome scene. At this point I feared Courtney might be unstoppable. The hallways were littered with her victims, and not even the security guards, who were storming through the halls in pairs, had managed to locate her yet. Ryan, said a weak voice. I looked up to see my mother's blue eyes staring at me from her hospital bed. I bolted over to her and wrapped my arms around hers. Hang in there, Mom, I said. I'm going to get you help. Blood gushed from the puncture wounds in her stomach. You need to stop your sister before she hurts anyone else, she said. She's traveling through the vents. I followed her eyes to the partially ajar ceiling tile above her head. You need to tell the doctors so they can... A knife whirled through the air and punctured her sternum. She let out a gasp as the blade pierced her heart, as if she'd been doused in frigid water, then closed her eyes and slumped forward. Courtney grinned at me from the ceiling panels. Her eyes glowed like fire in the shadows, and her lips were pale and covered in blisters. Looks like I can add one more point to my score, she said. You need to catch up quickly, Brian. You're still at zero. You're a monster, I said. A heartless demon. Sometimes you have to be a monster in order to win, and I'm winning big time right now. You better catch up quick, or you'll be a loser forever. She nodded at the knife sticking out of my mother's chest. That one's for you, by the way. Consider it a pity gift. And she slithered back into the vents like a hunting xenomorph. I pulled the knife from my mum's chest, which pained me as if I was ripping the serrated blade from my own sternum. Luckily, the ceiling was fairly low. Using the bed as my jumping-off point... I grasped the vent and pulled myself past the tiles. The moment my knees reached the metal surface, I sighed with a relief. And then I crawled forward through the darkness, knife raised. Courtney's raspy breathing echoed incessantly through the darkness. Never in my life had I so desperately wanted a flashlight. If it wasn't for the occasional crack in the metal panels, darkness would have consumed my eyes. I tightened my grip on my knife. The handle was long and smooth and fit my fingers perfectly. Would I have the courage to jam it into Courtney's heart? Oh, I shuddered at the thought of feeling her sternum crunch under my trembling hand. Despite her rampage, she was still my sister. Could I truly end her life, no matter how miserable it had become? 
I tried to think of a way to avoid such a gruesome end, but every time the seed of a plan germinated in my mind, her laughter yanked these plans out by their roots. And so, I silenced my mind and hunted her through the darkness. A few turns later, a blinding torrent of light greeted my eyes. When my pupils adjusted to this sudden change in luminosity, I looked down and saw the tattered remains of an air filter. Dozens of boxes and shelves overflowing with medical equipment filled the room below. I scanned the aisles for Courtney. She remained nowhere to be seen. I lowered myself into the room, knife raised. Other than my hurried breathing, not a sound could be heard. I imagined Courtney's blood-filled eyes peering out from behind or inside one of the boxes scattered on the floor and resisted the urge to shudder. After a minute of searching, I came upon the corpse of a security guard. His body was riddled with stab wounds and such severe lacerations spanned his neck his skin looked like the desolate remains of an exploded balloon. And then the lights went out. If it wasn't for the single emergency panel shining above the door, the room would have plummeted into complete darkness. I squinted my eyes against the blackness. The shelves loomed over me like square-shaped apparitions. In my frightened state, I imagined Courtney crouching on top of each of them, knife raised and ready to pounce on me the moment she got the chance. I sidestepped toward the center of the room. A laugh burst out from behind one of the shelves. Courtney, I yelled, is that you? My question was answered by another laugh. That's enough. You win. You beat me, okay? This doesn't have to go on any longer. But it does, Brian, said Courtney. Her voice was three tones too deep. There are no forfeits in this game. I'm going to kill you and prove once and for all who is the better player. My legs quivered. I raised my knife in preparation to defend myself. This isn't the game, I said, voice frantic. Those people you killed are really dead. Mom and Dad are really dead. And soon you will be too. I screamed as a knife passed through my thigh. I wheeled around and tried to grasp Courtney with my free hand, but my fingers were greeted with nothing but air. Another laugh boomed from the unseen places in the darkness. My thigh seared with pain. I cringed as blood dripped down my calf in waterfall-like bursts. Don't pass out, said Courtney's voice from the blackness. We're just getting started. I stumbled toward the sound of her voice. You're sick, Courtney. I said, but I can help you. You just need to control yourself. We both know you're not going to kill me. Is that so? I heard footsteps whisper across the concrete, but before I had time to react, her knife had slashed my other thigh. I tumbled to the ground. Oh, I didn't hurt you, did I? said Courtney, vanishing once again into the darkness. Those are just flesh wounds. Don't tell me you can't handle a few little cuts. I thought you were stronger than that. My breathing was too shallow to respond. Colorful dots filled my vision. I resisted the urge to vomit. Courtney must have sensed my defeated state, for a few moments later she stepped out from behind one of the boxes and approached me. You're much weaker than I thought, she said. She placed her hand under my chin and tilted my face toward her. Her skin looked so twisted and decayed, I hardly recognized her. She kicked my knife from my hand and sent it skidding under one of the shelves. She then stared at me with her blood-filled eyes for so long, I felt like I'd been hypnotized. I almost regret killing you, she finally said. Playing with you has been so much fun. I want to do it over and over again until my knife has no more parts of you to cut. Ah, unfortunately, no one likes an ungracious winner so this final slice will have to do. She raised a knife above her head. This is goodbye. I wish I could have said you played well, but you know Mum and Dad taught us never to lie. I tracked the knife as it soared through the air with my ever-darkening vision. 
What happened next I can only attribute to reflex. Just as the knife passed within an inch of my jugular, I shot my hand up from my hip like a gunslinger drawing his pistol and stopped the blade with my palm. Then, ignoring the pain shooting up my arm, I punched Courtney in the nose so hard her cartilage crumpled beneath my knuckles. She crashed to the ground. Before she had time to right herself, I kicked her in the temple. Air flooded from her lungs as she lost consciousness. The sight of my little sister's lifeless body filled me with both pleasure and despair. I tore the knife from her hand, leaned over her emaciated ribs, and prepared to drive my blade through her heart. No matter how badly I wanted to end her miserable life, I couldn't force myself to lower the blade. Now that she was unconscious, her complexion improved which gave me hope that maybe one day she could be cured of whatever sickness had overtaken her mind. So I let the knife tumble from my fingers, took a few steps backwards, and collapsed to the ground beside her feet. A police officer passed through the door just as I was falling unconscious. I tried to call out for help, but blackness overtook my vision before I could even open my mouth. Courtney has been in a psychiatric hospital ever since. None of the doctor's treatments have helped her. Her incessant laughter echoes through the halls of the asylum with such frequency that multiple nurses have resigned in the month following her arrival. Today, Courtney spends most of her days tethered to her bed, screaming my name over and over, desperate for a rematch. I live in constant fear of the hour she breaks free from her restraints and assaults me in my room. What is wrong with my sister? I don't know and probably never will. All I know is that I regret the day I had the opportunity to kill her, but pity stayed my hand. Oh my god, so that is the very definition of, well, that escalated quickly, don't you think? Fantastic, weird, wonderful, and horrific story from the author of the Vatican Archives. Yep, another fantastic story there from him. Brilliant, don't you think? Well, thoughts, feelings, terrors <laughs> in the comment section below the video, and I'll do my best to uh, reply to as many as I can. Well, it's Wednesday, but tomorrow I feel like giving you a treat, so... What do you feel like? Do you want more of the Freemason stories? Or would you like um, a continuation of the vampire adventure from the Vatican Archives? Let me know about that too, and um, I'll get a little something ready for you for tomorrow evening, okay? Well, until then, my dear friends, very, very sweet dream. Some bye-bye. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this story today. It really means a lot to me and to the author of the story, of course. Well, if you want to know more about me, I'm pretty much everywhere on social media. You can find me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. You can download my music on SoundCloud. Um, I've got a Patreon if you feel like. Throw me a dollar or two. Very much appreciated. And of course, on Reddit, I have a place where you can leave stories if you want me to read one that you've written. Well, hoping to see you all again very soon. Till then, sweet dreams. Bye-bye.